So um, I talk to a lot of young folks who um, tell me they want to go into zoo medicine. I, I try to dissuade them, but somehow, I don't know, I think maybe there's some television shows that, that portray my field as being incredibly fabulous and glamorous. And I, um, I try and tell them that that's not true. Um, that this is really kind of, um, except for the fact that I work with incredibly cool animals, it's, it's a really, in many ways, uncomfortable field. Um, it is the lowest paying of the, of the veterinary fields. It has crazy hours. If, if there's an emergency at, at two o'clock in the morning with, with, a, with a giraffe, you go in for it because many of these animals require multiple people. So it's not like in a human uh, or even a, a, a small animal veterinary clinic where maybe there's one person on call. You know, if there's an emergency with a giraffe, you need as many hands as possible. So you never have a day off. Um, you're often working in kind of icky conditions. So uh, this is me and, and I, um, I look like I come from some strange Eastern European culture, but <laughs> this is when I was working at a zoo on the Pacific West Coast and it always was raining, always, every single day it was raining. So if you had to do anything, you had to wear plastic clothing and I'm wearing plastic pants a plastic top, a schmata on my head. It's just terrible. <laughs> I, I always look like yuck. And that's in comparison to like cat vets. Cat vets are like cats. They're always Im immaculately groomed. And I always look like I got dragged through the dirt. Um, I heard Stuart say something about him, or maybe if Sandra wanted to see cute. Um, I do work with cute, but I also work with some really, really dangerous animals. This is me doing surgery on a a uh, green mamba. This is the second oh, most deadly snake in the world. And um, uh, this, this uh, was um, really um, an interesting experience because uh, it was brought in by a very experienced uh, zookeeper. It had gotten uh, an injury at the zoo, but everybody in the hospital found some reason to leave because this snake is so deadly. And so um, I realized that I'm all by myself with this keeper. And when you work with animals like this, before you even start, you set out bottles of antivenin, you set out bottles of gamma globulin, you discuss CPR, you notify the paramedics, God forbid something goes wrong. So I don't always work with cute fuzzy things. Um, I really enjoy working with the non-cute fuzzy things, but I also, try and dissuade students who think that all I do is like hug baby tigers. I don't. Um, and, um, you know, here's me again wearing plastic clothing. This was um, an elephant. I was doing an ultrasound uh, in a barn in Florida in July and I'm wearing plastic clothing. And the elephant doesn't really like the ultrasound and so she's kicking me. Um, so, you know, these are not optimal working conditions. Um, there are accidents in zoos. Um, safety is a very, very big thought process of anything I do. I am responsible for my safety, my team's safety, the animal safety, and that's not always an easy thing. Um, and because I work with super dangerous animals, this is a real photograph. This is a, a colleague uh, in, um, in China who um, had his arm bitten off. That is actually his arm in the alligator's mouth. Oh. Um, and they were able to reattach it. So since I work with these super dangerous animals, this to me is a, a, a terrible, terrible safety breach, obviously. But I have to work with, with, with crocodilians. Um, uh, and, and so it's very important to uh, prevent these things from happening. That means that um, before I even go into the, the environment or the cage or the enclosure with an animal, I have already prepared all sorts of protocols for working with them safely. With crocodilians, very big ones, you usually need two or three people with a great deal of experience. We actually offer classes in how to handle these animals. And the mouth and the tail are roped and the ropes are held on either side. The animal is then strapped down to a board that exactly fits it so it can be moved by that board rather than touching the animal, which tends to trigger 
uh, very aggressive behavior. So to me, when I see things like this, this is a tragedy, but it also tells me that a lot of the preparation <laughs> had to be done. Um, and so that's a big component of my job is knowing what needs to be done and not going in to do things until those preparations for safety are, are established. I've always loved, this is one of my favorite Gary Larson cartoons of all time because he just nails it. Uh, you know, it's, it's the zoo vet and he's got a peg leg and he's wearing a patch and he's got a hook for an arm and his autobiography is titled Zoo Vet, I Quit. <laughs> and that, that really was the way we used to, um, you know, medicine has come along, but we now have appropriate anesthetics. We have a lot of really good protocols. Um, and this sort of thing isn't that common, but is it, it just is out there. It is out there. We do have, I, I do have colleagues who have, uh, you know, lost fingers or, or parts of their body um, because they were trying a new anesthetic that, um, hey, didn't work and the bear woke up on the table. Um, so, so we um, deal with that, that, uh, that part of, of, of the, the animal world too. And it's something that a lot of vet students don't see. They just think about cuddling baby tigers. Um, I actually thought I should, I, I know Rachel wants a lot of funny stories and there will be a lot of funny stories, but I, I actually thought I should also give some real information. And so this was something I went and researched for this talk. And I didn't know that the very first zoo vet uh, was at the London Zoo in the 1800s. Um, but it, the thing is that th this is a very recent field. My own vet school, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, still doesn't offer any training in zoo medicine and many vet schools don't. I think there's only like 28 vet schools in the country. And of those maybe 15 even have a zoo vet program. And that's because there aren't any jobs. This is not a very um, uh, useful thing to prepare students for. I actually didn't know there was such a field as zoo medicine when I went to vet school and I graduated without having any experience in it. Um, in 1953, there are only five zoo vets in the United States, and, and even today, there's about 200, which is still a very, very small number. Um, um, and, and so, I, you know, I think that um, it's a fascinating field, but I, another reason I dissuade students from going into it is because there's just so few jobs. There's so few zoos, and there's so few jobs, and it's always good to have a plan B and a plan C, so learn you know, domestic animal medicine before you start dealing with uh, funny creatures like badgers. And I will tell you that this badger is, is also uh, one of the more dangerous animals I work with. Um, I, um, I had to dart her to work on her. She had something going on with her foot and she didn't let anybody get close enough to even look at it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how I handle animals um, to get a good look when uh, they're not cooperative and they also want to eat my face. Um, very, very cute little animal, but boy, you don't want to be alone with a badger. Um, zoo medicine is also kind of a weird field because it includes um, basically everything living that's an animal on the planet. And I think somebody recently gave that number at like 3 million animals. Now, zoos really only have, you know, a couple of, of hundred animals. Um, and there are many species we don't even know anything about. Um, but the idea in, in the training of a zoo vet is to be able to handle anything. And I actually heard uh, an, a man who was an astronaut, he had helped build the space station, give a talk. And, and in his talk, he said that when we finally make contact with extraterrestrial life, and he firmly thought we would do so in the next couple decades, he said it was zoo vets who would provide their health care. And at that point, I completely tuned out because all I could think was, oh, no, another species where I have to figure out what tentacle to put the EKG machine on and how not to get bitten by it. Um, <laughs> but he was right in the sense that we can't be trained in how to take care of every single species on the on the planet. So we're trained in thought processes, how to approach a species that we we don't know much about. Um, and and even though it's called zoo and zoo medicine, it really should be called zoo and wildlife medicine. I do hear that term a little bit more often because a lot of people who are trained in zoo medicine go on to 
take care of animals uh, that are not in human care. Um, they are part of conservation uh, projects, research studies on wildlife, um, and they, we also take care of aquatic animals. So about five years ago, I started working uh, with an aquarium and started doing fish medicine, which was completely different than any other kind of medicine. I, I very much enjoyed it, but um, that's also under the umbrella of zoological medicine. Um, and by the way, um, this is an alligator named Skippy who does know his name. He is 14 feet long and, be, and, and Skippy was pretty cool. Um, his trainer uh, had him open his mouth for me because uh, we were dealing, doing just a physical exam. Um, what bothered me were all of his family members who were behind me, who were just kind of doing their own thing. And uh, so this is kind of a stupid picture. The cast on my arm is unrelated to Skippy, but um, stupid pictures are things that I don't do anymore because I'm, I'm old now and I don't move as quickly when things go wrong. Um, being able to move quickly and leap over fences is a very good skill to have when you're a zoo. Um, and, and like I said, this is a field that's very small. It's a very recent field and very few people actually go into it. A lot of people are fascinated by it, but very few people go into it and many struggle to find adequate training. Um, and of the, of the, you know, maybe 500 accredited zoos in the United States, about three quarters of them actually employ a full-time vet. Um, I myself do a lot of um, contract work with vets, with uh, facilities that don't have a full-time vet. And, um, you know, so again, there's not a lot of jobs. If you want to be a zoo vet, uh, you can go to vet school and hope you'll get hired by a zoo. But these days it's a very competitive field. So there are these internships and residencies, and then there are those are highly competitive and some zoos want you to do multiple internships. Um, there's some facilities that, especially if you're going to go into wildlife, you're going to work with, let's say, the Nature Conservancy or uh, World Wildlife Federation. They want you to have a PhD. So after vet school, you might get additional uh, training. Um, and then there's people like me who just sort of made a left turn uh, and wound up taking care of elephants. And my career doesn't make sense to anyone. Um, and I, I try to tell students that I am not, my career is so bizarre that it is definitely not a role model for anyone, um, but there it is. Um, like I said, we're the ultimate generalist. This whole list is, is things that I, I regularly take care of with all these different species. Um, internal medicine, surgery, specialty stuff like cardiology. Although these days, because veterinary medicine does have so many uh, specialties, things like uh, cardiology and neurology, very often when I have an animal with a serious uh, heart problem, I do call in a veterinary cardiologist. Um, and that's great because those people have so much additional training and specialized equipment. Uh, they come in and they'll do an echo on an animal and they'll, uh, they'll, they'll do exactly the same measurements that you might get uh, if you went in for a cardiac workup. And that's a, a real benefit. Um, I often just do the initial thing. So I might uh, listen to a, an animal's heart and go, wow, that doesn't sound right. I think there's an arrhythmia, but um, that's when I'll call in a cardiologist to, to come and evaluate them. And a lot of the, the veterinary specialties enjoy working on strange animals, even though they're not, um, they're not trained in it. And some be, do become very experienced. So uh, that's, that's quite enjoyable. One of the terms up here that you may not recognize is stereogenology. And that's what we call the field of uh, reproductive medicine. So that's everything from um, uh, uh, basically it, OBGYN, um, delivery, uh, making sure that animals are fertile, um, things like artificial insemination. Um, it's, it's a really interesting field and um, also very complicated when you look at the diversity of animals because that's one of the big um, goals of, of, of zoo medicine is to get animals to reproduce. Um, we're dealing with a lot of uh, endangered species, and the more uh, animals that are on the planet, the 
the farther away we are to extinction, which continues to be a growing problem. So that's something that I enjoy a great deal. Um, and um, baby animals, baby zoo animals are adorable. Uh, behind me actually is a family of moose at a facility I work. And you can see on my, on my right is um, the baby. And those are her parents on the other side. Um, so I do a lot of clinical work, but um, zoo veterinary medicine, the, the non-glamour part of it is, is a, lot of, um, a lot of office work. Um, I, when we move animals from one facility to another, if they cross state lines, there is an unbelievable amount of paperwork that needs to be done. Um, there are all sorts of OSHA, USDA government rules on, on the care of these animals, and that has to be uh, carefully documented. We deal with um, safety issues, not just in the clinical way, but we, we um, worry about things like zoonotic diseases. Those are diseases that can go from people to animals or animals to people. And so, um, for example, um, great apes are very susceptible uh, to human common colds. And what is just a common cold for us can kill a gorilla. But you, you know, the question is, so if somebody has a cold, um, you can't just say, all right, we're not paying you, you have a cold. You have to have protocols so that they know where they can go if they're not feeling well. A lot of the things that we're doing as, as a, in COVID times are things that we do regularly in, cold, in at zoos so as not to expose our animals to diseases that um, could be deadly for them. Uh, we get involved in exhibit design because there's this big trend to naturalistic exhibits and they're very beautiful and you look at them and it looks like giraffes on the Serengeti, but they're so realistic that basically there's no way for me to access the animal or even look at them. Um, and that has been a problem. And so zoo vets are starting to get involved with the architects who are designing these exhibits so that we can still do our job. I very often am a public speaker like I'm doing now to tell people what I do. I get engaged in media relations. Good news, hey, we have a new baby and, and sad news. We've had um, our polar bear has passed away at the age of 30. Um, and, and it's nice when people can hear it from a veterinarian because it, it demonstrates that you know, these animals were really well cared for. Um, and zoos do take very good care of their animals. I think there's been a lot of uh, negative um, conversation, but I have worked at probably 75% of the zoos in the United States uh, as a consultant or, or in some cases as a, a, an associate. And these animals are beautifully cared for. Um, and it's unfortunate to me that there's so much negativity toward them. I do a lot of education. I talk to kids, I talk to vet students, and I also do a lot of paperwork. We are still in veterinary medicine, often not, um, not entirely computerized. And believe it or not, when animals move internationally, so if I move, let's say a gazelle to Canada, the paperwork that the governments require me to use, it requires a typewriter. Let me tell you how hard it is to find a typewriter these days because they have to be typed in quadruplicate and they actually have that icky paper that like turns your hands purple. But we're still doing stuff like that. Um, the things that I enjoy are often the challenges and, um, and, and they range from the variety of sizes. I deal with animals that weigh a couple of uh, grams to um, elephants and there are veteran, zoo veterinarians who specialize in whales, you know, even bigger than elephants. Um, both sides of the size spectrum have a lot of uh, challenges. There's safety issues, as I've pointed out, and, and it's safety for us, but it's sometimes safety for these animals where we don't know a lot about them. Um, sometimes we get very, very surprised by the results. Um, there is, for example, a, a drug that we use in anesthesia in multiple cat species, but if you use it in tigers, um, a, a large percentage of them will start seizuring. And we don't know why that is, uh, but we do know that now. Um, but the first person who used that drug in a tiger because it worked so great in leopards and lions and everything else, I had a very ugly surprise. And, and there are ugly surprises in veterinary zoo medicine when we don't know everything. 
And that's because so little data is out there. You know, we talk a lot in human medicine and in domestic animal medicine about evidence-based medicine. Well, there are days where I feel like a, a magic eight ball would be as good a way to figure out what I'm doing as anything else. Um, I have worked with species where, um, I, I, to give you an example, the, the, the Chinese giant salamander is a three foot long salamander. I think there's four papers written about it. Um, all of the papers are written in Chinese and um, I had to deal with one. I, it was my first week at a zoo and everything goes wrong for me when I start a new job. And um, I, I, this animal was the most bizarre thing that I had ever seen in my life. And um, it had died overnight. And we always do autopsies on our animals. And when I started doing the autopsy, I couldn't even recognize its organs, okay? <laughs> that is a terrible thing. I'm looking at this going, what is this? And there was <laughs> one organ that there appeared to be three of them. And that really threw me for a loop because you know we have two kidneys, we have two lungs, but I couldn't think of anything that we have three of. Um, and so I just kept pretending like I knew what I was doing because you know, you don't want to cause anyone to panic or think that you're an idiot. Um, I'm probably one of three people in the world who have ever done, uh, who's not Chinese, by the way. I'm probably the only person who isn't Chinese who has, has done a, a necropsy on one of these things and one of, you know, four vets total. Um, so I just kept calmly, you know, taking my sections and putting them in little jars. And, um, and everybody thought it was going fine until the very end of the necropsy. And so we're, we're starting to clean up now. And I discovered that the carcass had glued itself to the metal necropsy table. This species releases some super glue from its pores. I, I've never seen anything like it. We <laughs> couldn't detach it from the metal, the metal table. We finally actually had to use a saw and we damaged <laughs> the table. And I, I mean, I'm just so, I still don't understand this. And, and even to this day, this is like, this occurred 10 years ago. We still talk about this. Hey, do you remember that time that dead giant Chinese salamander glued itself to the table after it was dead? Maybe we should have collected it and like made the world's best glue. And so this is the kind of bizarre thing that, that happens regularly because we don't know very much about some of these species. Another challenge is dealing with social systems. We, um, you know, a lot of these animals live in herds and groups. And if you um, remove one animal to let's say do veterinary, you can't reintroduce them, they'll get beaten up or you change that hierarchy in the group. And so that becomes a very big consideration if you wanna do something. And the final thing is many of these animals hide illness because if they were in the wild and they were you know, limping, um, they get eaten by something. Um, so you often don't find out that they're sick until they're really, really sick. And this becomes a day-to-day -day challenge in working with them. Um, I did want to show you that once in a while I do get to hug cute fuzzy animals. Um, so these are the two pictures I could find in my collection of me hugging cute fuzzy animals. And they were so cute and so fuzzy. It made up for like the times that I'm dealing with a green mamba. <laughs> We also deal with challenges that I don't particularly um, enjoy. And, and like I said earlier, there's a lot of anti-zoo sentiment. Um, and some of it is um, animal extremists, groups like PETA, HSUS, who are working very hard to shut down zoos and spreading a lot of uh, falsehoods about zoos. Um, there's also, uh, a very changing view of zoos, which, and those views range from, there's people who are struggling right now uh, in the time of COVID, why should we spend money on animals, uh, to recognition that um, zoos are still not really doing as much as they could for conservation, but, um, you know, should we have zoos? Is it okay to use animals as entertainment? Is that really what zoos are? And so these are, these are discussions that are sometimes done without the zoo being included. And that's where I, I struggle because I, I think it's great to ask questions, but I also feel that when Google is your source of information, a lot of 
uh, incorrect information starts to spread. Zoos themselves are not always happy places to work. And, and there is a culture of bullying, which I have encountered uh, repeatedly. One of the things that has changed in the past 15 years is that it used to be um, that you worked your way up in a zoo. So you got hired, let's say, to probably not even take care of the animals, maybe to sell popcorn. And then if you did a good job at that, you might get to be a, a junior keeper and, and you know, uh, move hay from one barn to another or sweet manure. Um, and if you were good at that, you became a keeper and then maybe a, a senior keeper and a curator and a manager and you could work your way. And so the people at the top of the zoo were people who had been there a long time, knew those animals, loved those animals and understood the realities of, of, of zoological medicine, of zoological administration. That has changed. The administration of zoos is now hired from outside. They come from industry, law, banking, um, because zoos are often financially strapped. And so the, the, the qualities of these people is that they're very good at fundraising. They're often quite photogenic and they look good on a, on a television screen, but they often have no affinity for animals. In fact, they look at the zoo animals as commodities. And um, because it's very hard to hire somebody from something like banking where the salaries are very high to a zoo, which doesn't pay well, um, these people are offered very high salaries at the expense of the people doing all the work of managing the zoo. So while the director of a zoo is earning a half million dollars, the keepers aren't even getting, um, a, they're not being allowed to work full time, just short of full time, let's say uh, 30 instead of 32 hours a week so they don't get benefits and they're being paid minimum wage. So you have rapid turnover, you have uh, a very hostile culture um, and unfortunately, it also affects the care of the animals. When you have constant turnover, nobody gets to know these animals very, very well. Um, and then the final thing is that we do have a lot of geriatric animals in zoos, which is wonderful. We're taking better care of them. They're living longer, but they, we become very attached to them. They're our work colleagues as much as our, as our, our human colleagues are. And so the loss of an animal for any reason um, becomes a real source of grief. And it's different because when I do um, animals in private practice, I love animals, I absolutely do. But you know, when I do um, a vaccine on a dog that I see once a year, it, it's, it's passing is sad, it's very difficult, but it's generally easier for me to um, remain objective and not let it get personal. When it's an elephant I've cared for for 20 years who finally succumbs to, to heart disease, I grieve like I'm grieving a family member and so do the people I work with. And so that becomes um, a very difficult thing um, as that's, that's a, a part of my job. And it also becomes, I, I'm also very responsible for explaining what's going on to staff and also to outsiders and for me, certainly um, talking about grief when I myself am grieving is, is difficult. COVID has put a real monkey wrench into zoos. Um, because we've had to close for visitors um, there, and we're still feeding our animals, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars each week without any income, um, it has created enormous problems. Uh, also, now that we're having another surge, um, we had hoped that we could open for events. You know, we hold birthday parties at zoos and weddings get held at zoos, and we've had to cancel all of those. Um, and there's some fine, fine facilities that have closed permanently. And, and the one that breaks my heart is the Vancouver Aquarium, which is a marvelous aquarium and did a lot of work with um, stranded sea mammals, you know, otters covered in, in oil and uh, beached whales, they're closed for good. Several uh, big zoos are about to close. And although most zoos had put aside money, um, you know, in case of any kind of emergency, nobody expected this to keep going and going and going. So um, a lot of people are losing jobs. There are enormous layoffs. Um, I think um, very Soon there's going to be discussion of um, deaccessioning animals, and I don't know where they're going to deaccession to because this is every zoo in the world. 
but it's a very, very bad time. And the final issue is that zoo species are affected by COVID-19. Uh, multiple zoos have had uh, COVID-19 in their large cats. Um, the cats got it from keepers. Um, Mustelids are the weasel family. So that's otters, mink, uh, badgers, uh, ferrets. Um, and so um, we know that COVID-19 came from animal markets, bats most likely, but what we don't know is what other species are at risk. And several papers keep coming out um, that support a, a whole bunch of different species, species. And if you guys remember, I think it was like 15 years ago, we had SARS and SARS is the relative of COVID. And that was a big, big issue in, in, in a whole bunch of species that we're now evaluating in terms of COVID-19. So the question then is, okay, if we have a tiger with uh, COVID-19, can it spread it back to people? Can it spread it to other species? We don't know the answers, um, but it's a, it's a constant uh, concern that we have. And it also affects the care of the animals because, okay, if your tiger tests positive, you know, is it, is it ethical to let somebody to let a human become exposed, you know, how, how do you deal with this situation? And um, not everybody uh, agrees on what to do any more than we agree in the human world about what to do. So that's kind of my lead in and the rest of this is just fun stuff and fun stories and hopefully something um, educational. Um, and, and it becomes the question of how do I do what I do? How do we work? with these crazy endangered animals and, and take good care of them. And this is one of my favorite photographs I've ever taken. And this is an x-ray. Um, and I worked with California condors, which are one of the most endangered species in the world. They went from, I think there were 12 left in the wild. And because of the work of zoos, particularly the Los Angeles Zoo, where I was employed for many years, there's 400 of them in the wild, which is still um, far, far too, um, far too few, but um, there's many. And we started to uh, figure out how to um, hatch them in captivity and release them in ways where they had a better chance of survival. Um, and I'll talk more about why this radiograph is so important in a little bit. If you wanna be a zoo vet, you read constantly. I mean, I read all the time and I still don't know half of what I need to know, but um, we're finally, there's, there's some information and there's books, there's publications. I publish constantly, I lecture constantly. Um, the learning never ends. And that's something I really enjoy. And it's something I emphasize to students that if you wanna graduate from vet school and kind of sit in your easy chair after four very difficult years, um, this is not the field for you. The other thing is after you sort of learn the textbook stuff, you have to learn what's normal. And, and like I said earlier, animals hide signs of illness. But the other thing is when you don't know a lot about animals, it, it becomes difficult to go, is that, is that what they're supposed to do? You know, it, everything is a little different. So learning normal for me is, is constantly looking. I sit, when I go on vacation, I visit zoos. I love zoos. I, I love seeing the animals, but I see, you know, I, I try and learn the ends of the bell curve for a particular species. And you also have to learn what's normal for individuals. So male mooses are, are some of the most dangerous animals in the world. And on the, in the right picture where I'm wearing that little green coat, um, I was getting a photograph taken uh, for um, a committee that I sit on. And all of a sudden, the, my friend taking the photo said, Ellen, run, Dave is behind you. And Dave is, the, is, is a typical moose, he is a jerk. And, and he was gonna kill me. So this is where like, you learn to run really quickly and you'd like to a Dukes of Hazard jump in the truck before the moose bashes you in. Um, and, but that's typical moose, that's normal. On the right, it, I, on the other side where I'm wearing the blue coat is Tahoma. And I don't know why this moose is like this, but this is the nicest moose on the entire planet. He lets me brush him, he licks my face. I can do anything to him. I, I can draw blood on him and he just stands there. That is normal for him. There are plenty of animals that when they are not feeling well, suddenly seem docile and that's a sign of illness, but not with Tahoma, that he's just Mr. Charm. You have to learn, you know, 
the answer to the question, is the animal sick? And that sounds like the most stupid question in the world, but I ask myself that every day. Um, these elephants look like giant dead lumps of elephant, but they are sunbathing. That's what they do. This little guy, this, this little lion is, is he, you know, he's lying down, but if you look at him, he's kind of odd looking. He's actually a dwarf and he's, he's fine. I mean, there's nothing I'm gonna do about the fact he's a dwarf. He's been a dwarf all his life. He's got little stubby legs. I told the zoo not to breed him because we don't need dwarf lions. I could just see people like, hey, I'll get a dwarf lion in my New York City studio apartment. Um, so he's not normal, but he's also not sick. But these guys, this is a problem. On the top, this is a, 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 le a jaguar um, and he's got a tumor in his abdomen. He's super skinny and the, the zoo thought he was fat and you can see bones on him. He was very elderly and he had a, a very serious tumor. And the guy on the bottom, because after we had looked at the, the guy on the top, they brought me to see this mountain lion and I've never seen a cat this obese. This is unbelievable. This is the fattest cat I have ever seen in my life. So there's obviously a diet problem here, or maybe he has a hormonal problem. That's a, a possibility too. So it's the top one would be an emergency. The bottom one is, is not an emergency, but it's not something we can ignore. Um, very often I need to look at something close up. And one of the big changes and one of the big wonderful changes in zoo medicine is that we're now doing a lot of training so that animals are acclimated to having people near them and, and will do things. And this is great because this is a form of enrichment. This is fun for the animals. You know, they spend their lives in, a, in the same environment every day, but they get to do stuff with their with their keeper and keepers and their animals get really attached to each other. So many of our large carnivores are trained to present body parts. So you can see the lion and she's showing her belly. Um, this is a polar bear who's been trained to open his mouth. This is very helpful. I can look at this tiger. These are beautiful teeth. These are normal teeth on a young tiger. There's nothing fractured and the animals are rewarded. And this is this is a great thing for the keeper. You know, it's a nice break from cleaning and it's fun for the animal and it's great for me. This is Joni the walrus. Walruses get lots of dental problems. So here we can look at her teeth. And sometimes we can take that a step far farther. This is Boris, uh, the polar bear. And Boris, uh, they've, they've built an, uh, a doodad into his enclosure and he can put a paw there. And if I want to draw blood on Boris, I can do that. I don't have to sedate him, right? Because polar bears are, are definitely one of the most dangerous animals I deal with. But um, Boris is 30 years old and um, you know, sedating him is a very, very big deal. So Boris has been trained to put his paw in that enclosure. And you can see that there is um, a, a piece of metal, a piece of steel over it. So he can't lift his paw up. He's been trained to allow me to clip. And there is a vein, just like we have veins on the top of our hands. Um, and that's me. And I'm just putting some alcohol on it and I can get blood from him without any sedation. He can walk away if he doesn't want to participate. He's not forced to do this. What was so cool about this is that, so to keep the behavior fresh, we do this about once a week. It's no big deal. Sometimes we don't stick them. Sometimes we just go through the motions and poke them with a, uh, a, a syringe cap. Um, sometimes we actually get blood, but one day um, we uh, got blood on him and his blood had been entirely normal. And all of a sudden the blood was completely abnormal. And it turned out he had a um, developed a, 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 an obstruction in his gallbladder. He had a stone. And if we hadn't caught that, Within a day or two, he'd have been a horrible emergency if he'd even survived. But because we saw that, we know that gallstones are a big problem in polar bears. We were able to take to care of it. And so that actually saved his life. On the right is um, Kaleem. And this is an orangutan who was pregnant. And um, orangutans are a lot of fun. And they like some people a lot. And they don't like other people. And uh, before COVID, I had red hair. And I'm convinced that's why we got along so well. We both had red hair. But um, because she liked me, she was willing to come over. And I would um, ultrasound her pregnancy. 
And so we were able to follow that pregnancy all the way through, which was really neat. I will say that I had never, um, I was a baby vet when I had start, when I did this and I had never uh, um, ultrasounded a great ape. So I bought a book on, actually I, <laughs> Rachel's sister's friend loaned me a book on um, obstetrical ultrasound in humans. And it was a great book, but it would say things like, have the patient lie on her back and you stand on her left. Ask the patient to lift her shirt. And of course, you, what you can see is that she's like basically doing some sort of jungle gym act. She's got, what you can't see is she's got like a, a, a wad of celery in one arm. And, and, you know, it was not nearly as nice and tidy as it would be for a human obstetrician, but we still got beautiful images and we're able to follow the pregnancy all the way through. Um, this is a young lynx and the keepers thought she had broken, he, sorry, he had broken his toe and they wanted me to take an x-ray. And I said, okay, do we need to uh, anesthetize him because this is a 40 pound cat. Uh, and they said, oh no, he likes whipped cream. And I didn't really know what that meant. Um, so they brought him into my hospital and they put whipped cream all over the $100,000 uh, uh, x-ray machine, which I never did tell my boss about. Um, and it was actually great because he licked up the, the, the whipped cream and we were able to take beautiful diagnostic x-rays of his feet. And he had broken a toe, which we then were able to fix. So all this training is really terrific and uh, it makes their lives easier. It makes my life easier. And um, we, we try and get them prepared for all sorts of eventualities. Now, sometimes we need to actually restrain them. Um, and and that, that has various degrees of uh, success. On the, this purple picture on one side, that's me trying to restrain a giant Pacific octopus. That was a completely wasted effort. You cannot restrain a patient who has the consistency of jello. But I didn't really know what to do. They, they wanted me to look at a lesion on one of its uh, tentacles. And uh, so I tried to grab it and get a good look and really didn't go very well. Um, octopuses are very smart, very, very smart. And when he figured out what I was doing, he didn't like it. And he would wave his tentacle around and, and the water was 46 degrees because he's a Pacific octopus. And my hands were like turning the same color as that photo. It, it was difficult. So hand restraint um, isn't the greatest thing. Uh, here you can see us sort of restraining a little lion for a vaccine and, and she's not happy about it. And uh, this is a colleague of mine trying to restrain a camel. And shortly after this photo was taken, she got a hair full of camel spit. Um, and then sometimes we don't even try. I just love these photographs. Um, you know, these are just species that restraint is not going to happen. If the animal isn't trained to do what you want to do, you have to come up with a, a plan B. And so for some species, we are able to do res uh, physical restraint. We have special devices. You can see that's a, an adax, a very rare uh, antelope species in what we call a tamer. And these animals calm down when they're gently squeezed. And so this is a device that they, they run through a, a chute system for and they can be restrained and non-painful things are done here. Uh, mostly non-painful. They might get a, a vaccine or two, but nothing very serious. We can deworm them, we can do an exam on them and they're restrained. These are very expensive devices. They're specific for a, a particular species. Um, and here's an elephant, um, that's me. Um, I, because I'm short, I always get the job of sitting under the elephant, which is uh, nobody's favorite job, but this is how you do artificial insemination on an elephant. She's, she's restrained with some cotton ropes. She's been trained for this, so it's no big deal. Somebody's at her front end giving her snacks. I'm underneath and I'm threading an endoscope up her six foot long birth canal so I can deposit some uh, semen. And this is an art, uh, she actually did get pregnant from this, which was nice. Uh, these are other devices specific for animals. This is what we call a drop shoot trainer. And that guy bending over is actually trimming feet on an animal whose feet have been, he supported, the body of the animal supported up above, you can't see it, and below are the feet. Non-painful, very rapid, no anesthesia needed. And anesthesia can be quite risky in many of these animals. We design these corridors to move animals because obviously we're not gonna lift like a 400 pound antelope. Um, we create these corridors that the animals want to move through. And if you've ever seen like documentaries of them moving in groups, this allows them to move with their herd members in a way that's comfortable and not scary for them and push them into some of these devices so we can work on them. 
This on top is a squeeze cage. Um, the tiger is trained to go into it and then it has all these cool little doors that I can open. So let's say I want to ultrasound its belly and see if it's pregnant. I can push the bars in such a way that the animal can't turn around and eat my hand, but, and I can open a little door and get underneath and do the ultrasound. Very nice, very non-stressful once the animal's trained for them. And, and then there's sort of the low rent techniques. This allowed me to do all sorts of things on otters. It's just a piece of PVC tube uh, cut in half and, and attached to the side of the enclosure. And otters love to run through tunnels. So this was a natural behavior. And when they stood there, they were given a snack and then I could do all sorts of fun exams. Sometimes we need to be a little more hands-on. Uh, these are lemurs and we will restrain them. And um, you can see he looks a little drunk in this picture, actually in both pictures. That's because he's had a little bit of Xanax. Uh, Xanax or midazolam is a, uh, a great drug in, uh, in, in these guys. And, but we're still, because he can still move around and wiggle. Um, I, my, my, my helper is wearing uh, leather gloves. Uh, this one's wrapped in a towel. Sometimes we'll use nets. Small primates, birds will sometimes use nets for. And that's a real skill, by the way, when you get to work with keepers who are good at handling nets, because you can hurt somebody. You know, you hit, hit them with the net or you squeeze them too tight or you trap them in a way that as a vet, I still can't get at them. So a keeper who knows how to use a net is a valuable person to work with. We build special devices. This is a giraffe chute. Um, you can walk up the stairs. You can see on the side here. Rachel, can you guys see my little arrow as I point at things? Okay. Um, you can walk up here and access the head and the neck. And again, this animal has been trained to walk in here. It's non-stressful for them. We can work on feet below. It's a, a very expensive device that is worth its weight in gold. And this is um, what's called an ERD, an elephant restraint device. And some of you guys saw it when I talked about elephants a few weeks ago, but this too has little doors that I can get to a tusker. This is a very dangerous bull elephant and I can work on that tusker without uh, getting hurt myself. He's trained to it, he's relaxed and it allows me to do ultrasounds and look in the mouth and all these things um, without using any medication. Do most zoos have those kind of cages or restrained things? Do most zoos have them or only the rare? It is now a requirement that if you have elephants and certain other large species, you have these restraint devices. This is part of the compliance. And um, I, I would say that not all of them have really good ones. Um, some of the first ones that were developed are, you know, it, it, the early prototypes are, are kind of a problem, um, but many zoos are replacing them. Um, but yeah, if you have big animals, we still don't have good ways to handle species like hippos. Hippos are problematic. Um, and I, just about a year ago, I was asked to evaluate a special uh, device that had been invented for hippos and it was so cool and I think it'll be a big big plus but you know zoos need to come up with fifty thousand uh, dollars which is what these these kind of devices cost so that's the other other problem and they need to find room for them but yeah um sometimes though um, sedation is necessary we might be doing something painful or prolonged um, and we have a lot of different drugs these days. And the really fun thing is when we have the animal trained for hand injection. So when the animal isn't stressed out by um, an injection, it means I can use much lower doses of drugs because I don't have to fight adrenaline. Um, you know, if you get yourself worked up, uh, you, you need lots of drugs to get you down. But um, if they're trained, this is no big deal. Um, so here's the keepers and they're injecting her. She's been trained for this and she's gonna lie down. And now I can go in and I can put a face mask on her and then sedate her enough that I can put an intubation. It's a full general anesthesia. Not all animals can be trained, not all animals are trained. So another technique I can use is a pole syringe. This is basically a harpoon. And so if the animal is restrained in one of these nifty devices that, that you saw in the other picture, um, I can poke it with uh, my pole syringe. And then this is what you see uh, in a lot of wildlife. So you don't have these things out in the wild. Um, and the, when animals are darted from helicopters, uh, when they're doing the translocations, they're moving animals from one area to another, 
these are the systems they use. They go long distance, they shoot darts containing heavy duty anesthetics. Um, and um, you, know, you look like a real He-Man uh, when you're uh, doing these. Um, we rarely, rarely, rarely use them in zoos, um, except for once in a while, this is me and I am darting a lion who is just the biggest jerk in the world. And he needed a rabies vaccine. That's what he needed and he was completely impossible. But as you notice, I'm not using a giant rifle to shoot him. What I'm using is, is, is one of the, 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 the devices at the bottom. So these things on the top, these are long range rifles. This is what wildlife vets use. They, I, and, and when I worked at wildlife parks where I was shooting at elks across a, a football field and they have sights like a real gun, um, they just go hundreds of feet. That's what I use. Um, in a zoo, what I tend to use is either a blowpipe um, or I use a blowpipe with a CO2 handpiece. And um, because I had an obnoxious uh, colleague, I can tell you because he shot me with an empty uh, dart uh, using the CO2 charged blowpipe in my butt. And I'm actually still friends with this person, although I don't trust them very much. Um, it doesn't really hurt very much. It's sort of like getting stung by a bee. Um, it's a quick boop um, because the pressures are much lower. So I, when I do have to anesthetize an animal remotely, like I can't get up close or hand inject them, these are what I use and, and they, they're really, really nice. Blowpipes are actually a lot of fun. Um, they're, um, when they require a lot of practice to be good with them. And so when there's nice weather um, and when I used to have a backyard, I would like um, make myself a pitcher of lemonade and set up a target in the backyard and, and shoot blow empty blow. We have a uh, practice blow darts. They obviously don't have any drugs in them. And I just shoot at a target and it's just kind of fun and you get some friends together. So um, blow darting is actually fun. And when I used to do a lot of long distance shooting, um, I would regularly go to a, a rifle range. Um, and um, I would, you know, because you, you have to practice and boy, I, Women, I think, in, in it was, let's just put it this way. It was very weird being like a young woman indoors at a target range. Like, I don't know. It made me feel like a femme fatale or something. Um, anyway, these are what the darts look like. And they're, they're pretty nifty. They're, they, um, they're hollow inside. We fill them with drugs. Um, some of them actually have a, a charge attached to the, the cap end. Some of them we can pump through with uh, CO2. And so we pressurize them and they come in a variety of different sizes. Um, the smaller, the better because they fly better, just like, you know, like a bullet. And then some of these needles that we've developed are really cool. We have needles that um, are used in wildlife and they can get biopsies. They go in, they take a punch and they come out. So if we need DNA or we're trying to track a disease, um, we never even have to put hands on the animal. The, the needle does all the work for us. Uh, some of these needles with uh, barbs. So when you try and dart something like a rhinoceros or a hippo where they have super, super thick skin, if you don't have one of these, the needle usually pops, you know, bounces off and it doesn't eject. So these help keep the, the needle in place so that the drug that's inside the dart can actually um, be expelled and anesthetize the animal. And like I said, we do a lot of practice. Um, it is important, and I tell people this, that you, you don't step up the first time with darting equipment and a live animal. You need to be practicing. You need to know how to use that gun inside and out, whether it's a blowpipe, a rifle, or a CO2 powered handpiece. You need to know what you're doing. You need to have practice so you know if the gun shoots high or low, if the sight is accurate. Um, and then you also need to know where to shoot and you wanna go for big muscle masses. Um, it's important to know something about the animal, like zebras who have gotten a, a, used to being darted and, and they don't like it. They'll often present you their butt and they start swinging their tail back and forth. And if you know that animal, you know when the tail goes just like this and how well your gun works so you can hit them in the tush with the gun. Um, I have a friend who's very good at dealing with monkeys who like to spin around on ropes and he knows when the rope gets entirely spun and it starts to unwind that that's the time that he can get the dart in. So there's a lot of preparation that's involved. And, 
And I, I have um, been rather vocal with some students about, you know, this, this is not like a pinball or what's it called paintball where you're running around having a grand time. This is a really serious deal. And if you do it incorrectly, somebody, including your patient could get really injured. Rachel, am I going too long? I can speed up. Um, when, well, we started a few minutes late, but um, I think we should start wrapping up a little bit. So okay. So like I said, most of these are some of the training that we do. We do radiographs, we train for radiographs, we train them to get into crates. The hornbill, so it doesn't have to be a cute mammal, but they can go into crates. It's important because some of them will um, have to be moved. This was a hippopotamus that we moved from one zoo in Colorado to another zoo in Missouri. And she just casually walked into the crate and it was no big deal because months and months and months and months have been spent practicing getting her acc acclimated to it. Uh, this is a really fun um, video. And this is a lion who has high blood pressure, hypertension, and is on all sorts of blood pressure medication. And when you have an animal with that kind of disease, you really don't want to, um, anesthetize them any more than necessary. So it's a big male. He's been trained to give us his tail and to allow a blood pressure cuff to be put around it. And he's very patient. Somebody's giving him some meatballs up front. So he's, you know, not, not upset at all. He's sitting still. And now we've got, we can do a reading. And unfortunately, he just had primary hypertension like some people do, and he'll probably be on uh, blood pressure medications for the rest of his life. This animal also allows us to take blood on him from his tail. They have very nice veins in their tail. And um, now here's, a, here's a tiger who's allowing us to get blood from a tail. So lots of diagnostics without, uh, without getting involved. You've already seen Boris and him giving me his hand. And here is a blood draw on a walrus. And, and these are called blind sticks. Walruses are problematic in that they have no visible vessels. So you have to know where they are and, um, and stick your needle in. And I, do we have, yeah, that's a two, um, one minute video. We'll, we'll show this one. How do you want to? So what we do is we put hard, uh, we put um, hot water on it to make the vessel stand up. You still don't see the vessel. We know where it is. She's been trained to stand still. This is Joni. She weighs about um, 200, about 2,000 pounds. And she's just standing there. And did we get blood? I don't know if we got blood. Yeah, you can see a little blood in the hub there. So we've gotten it. And she just stands she's there so we can get blood. She's not giving it up today, Boogie. We'll skip some of these. They are amazing, but this is a um, this is a nice uh, orangutan who has asthma, and she's been trained to allow us to put stuff under her tongue. There she is. Good. Um, like I said, we can do uh, echoes. Um, gorillas Our are very very prone to heart disease. That is trained to present his or her um, chest to the cage the mesh. We train the gorillas to present for two in, positions. In grade eight, so the first position is chest straight and against so the mesh. Trained, uh, these are human and the second position is left um, side flush against the mesh. We, echoes, we also train changes. for left hand up and left hand down. Next, we desensitize them to a capsule with the rod that acts like a mock probe. So really neat that we can do this. And when your elephants are really well trained, you walk them into the hospital. So this is an elephant that came in with her keeper and she um, had um, some, some lameness. And I wanted to take a, 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 an x-ray of her, of her carpus, which is a, a front, front leg joint. And so she just walked in. We had to find a door she was big enough to fit in. Um, and then she walked into the radiology room and we took films and she was a good girl. I will say that um, she came in with a friend who was not as well behaved as she was and proceeded to um, eat parts of the ceiling tiles, but we, we will skip over that. Um, but you can see it's a beautiful x-ray of, of her leg. Um, you know, the training is great. It doesn't always work, um, but when it, it happens, it, it really allows us to do all sorts of neat things. And 
I just want to show you that sometimes I build shoes for my patients. So this was, this was a little bird who was born. I can't even remember what species. I think it's an emu or something. And he was born with a, a birth defect so that his feet were curled over and, and he couldn't walk. And that, that would have been the end of him. But he allowed me to build him shoes so that we could strengthen the muscles and straighten out the tendons. And it was so cute. He looked like he was wearing little, I don't know, like snowshoes. And every few days we would have to, you know, make bigger ones and, and he recovered. It was very nice. <laughs> we do stuff with rare species, black-footed ferrets um, and, and California condors are species that are back in the wild again um, because, of, of, um, because of zoos. And I told you I would tell you something fun about, about that first photograph. There's that egg again. And the reason those California condors are, are back is because we're, we're, we're allowing the eggs uh, to be uh, raised in captivity. And one of the things is, um, you know, in a human birth, the baby could be malpositioned and the obstetrician has to turn the baby around. Well, we can get malpositions in eggs. In, if, the, if the baby isn't in the right position, it will not be able to get into the egg. Um, so the first step is to figure out, uh, I'm sorry, if the baby's not in the right position, it won't be able to get out of the egg. Um, and so the first step is to take an x-ray of it and we can see if the baby is in the right position. This is sort of like when you get an ultrasound done uh, when you're pregnant. And this baby is in the right place. The head is on the right side and we know we mark the right side uh, with wire so we can distinguish it. And the head is underneath the, ring, the, the wing. And so we know exactly where that needs to be. What I've done is shown you all sorts of malpositions where the baby can't get out without help. And unfortunately, these three with the, with the red line through it are fatal positions. The baby will die in that egg. But with these other ones, we can help them. So when it's, we know exactly how many days it takes between the time the egg is, the lay, is laid and the time it is to hatch. And at the day of hatch, we make a little tiny window in the egg to give it a, head, a foot up or a beak up. And here we are doing that. Here's the keeper, he's wearing sterile gloves and he's helping that chick out of the egg because it was in a position where we knew it wouldn't be able to get out on its own. And step-by-step step, he's pulling, here's the little head, he's pulling him out. Here's the empty egg and here's the baby. And, and yes, birds do have an umbilicus even though they're in an egg. And so he's cauterizing the umbilicus and here's the baby drying off in its in its little in little bed. And so this is fantastic stuff. This is why we went from 12 to 400. Um, and we, with the California condors, we follow them throughout their life. These, this is a growing chick. You can see he's already about, about six pounds and quite fluffy. Uh, he's wearing a hood and that keeps him really calm. But these, this is a wild. And even when we release them back to the wild, we, we watch them. This is an animal that um, we brought back into the clinic because he wasn't acting right. He'd been released. And this chick uh, was eating garbage. This is what I took out of him. He was eating out of a trash. And so remember, condors are, are scavengers. Well, they sometimes go to places they shouldn't. And so he was eating light bulbs. But because he was being monitored, I could get rid of the light bulbs and they're gonna do some more training. So he learns to recognize that light bulbs are not an appropriate food stuff. I do wonder that maybe this is not the most intelligent condor on, on the planet, but we have to deal with what we have to deal with. You know, and if they're only 400 animals, we you know, can't necessarily find the Einsteins of the condor population, but we are working very hard to increase them. And this is important because we are in an extinction crisis. And unless we work really, really hard we are not, we're not gonna get ahead of it. So that's part of why I do what I do. And I got to the end, sorry it was too long. I always talk too much. No, this was fantastic. Does anyone have any questions that you wanna ask? You can unmute yourself if you have questions. Thank you, it's very interesting. Thank you for listening. Um, I did have questions and now I forgot all my questions. That's okay. You know where I live. You can always ask me questions. But, support, <laughs> but when your zoos open, support your zoos. They're doing great work and they're really, really struggling now. And, and when you go and visit, if you're allowed to visit, I know many of them 
are allowing you know small numbers of people and you have to schedule it online but every time you go to a zoo right now you're keeping them afloat so that's my plug for zoos and for us zoo vets <laughs> i'm uh, i'm doing a lot of zoom consultations and i can tell you telemedicine stinks i hate it yeah. Yeah. Ellen just assisted in a birth of an elephant up in Canada via telemedicine. By telemedicine. So yeah, that I do a lot of that these days. But um, yeah, I, they're doing a good job. Go see for yourself. And if you ever have an opportunity to talk to some of the keepers, ask them about you know what a day is like for them because they're they're really fun to talk to and they're always so excited to to, to tell you about their animals. Anyway, I have taken up enough of your morning and thank you so much for inviting me and thank you for listening and uh, stay safe and healthy and, and warm. Thank you so much, Ellen. We love having thank you. you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Uh